Hello everyone, I'm Alexis and um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about computational law, which is something that I'm working on. And uh, I like to describe myself as a recovering lawyer. And you know how in therapy they tell you to fight your demons and your abusers and all the trauma that's happened to you? I think I'm kind of doing that right now because I'm the co-founder of Legalese and I uh, our open source research is at the startup, it's run at the SMNU Center for Computational Law. And, um, and, and the whole idea of computational law came up because uh, as a lawyer, a litigator, a corporate lawyer, then a litigator, and now a recovering lawyer, one thing that increasingly dawned on me during my lawyering days was that because law predates software, legal today, is not quite equi equipped to solve the problems it purports to solve. It's kind of like asking your taxi driver, you know, when you get in the car, hey man, how do you think you're going to invent ride sharing apps? It's a bit preposterous. So, you know, at, at what we do, we like to talk about how software is eating law, and this is a little bit of what that looks like. So it's all started with a little company. Uh, I'm a recovering lawyer and my co-founder is a computer scientist. Uh, I am now industry director at SMU Center for Computational Law, and Meng is the principal investigator in the at the center where we are supported by the Singapore government, which is supported by the Ministry of Law and the National Research Foundation of Singapore. And we our objective is to work on computational law and well, at least our version of it. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about that. But speaking of co-founders, um, you know, everyone knows these two guys here also a recovering lawyer and a computer scientist, but in the sense, you know, it was physics, but you know, physics is like harder computer science. But the reason I brought them up was because, you know, they have, you know, their company started up, you know, has run for a long time and they launched the PayPal Mafia and lots of people who worked under them have gone on to exciting careers and built exciting companies. But I don't really want to talk about those companies. I want to talk about Thiel's book, Zero to One, a little bit, just for a second. I want to burn an idea from there to set the stage. In Zero to One, he talks about progress coming in two forms. With horizontal progress, you copy things that work. You look at a problem that's currently being solved by a typewriter, for example, and you think, I know, let's throw 10 typewriters at it. That's horizontal or extensive progress. But vertical progress is a whole other game altogether. You look at something that's currently being solved by one typewriter and you think, I don't think 10 typewriters is going to solve the problem. I think we should invent the word processor. Now hold that thought for a second and think about law, because the first thing before we can even go into computational law, we have to understand at least what I think the problem of legal is. We have to first ask whether legal is broken. A lot of people certainly seem to think so. No, they really think so. There are a lot of articles like that. The Atlantic especially really thinks legal is broken. And with that, I'd like to ask you, you know, what do you think people do when they need legal help today? I think most of you know the answer. You go to a lawyer. This is me on a good hair day. And, you know, a lawyer version 1.0 might look something like this. Or you phone a lawyer friend. But what really happens when you go to a lawyer today? Well, we charge you 600 an hour for input, not output. We are kind of error prone because, you know, we're humans. That's what we have to prove we like crazy. But, you know, billable hours work for you on that front. So um, we have imperfect recall again because we're human. And it also depends on whether or not we've had our first coffee of the day or if we're on our seventh. We rely a lot on experience which is really interesting because when you go to a lawyer and you say, you know, why do you think you're the best lawyer, the best law firm to do this? The lawyer will say, well, it's because uh, I will give you bespoke advice that's tailored to your needs. I know exactly what you need. It is so special. It is so unique. And I will give you special tailor made bespoke advice. But at the same time, when you ask them, why not go to the other guy next door because it's cheaper, his whatever, and the same lawyer will tell you, well, you know, for that bespoke experience, I've the bespoke work that I'm giving you, I'm relying a lot on experience because I've done this 5,000 times. And of course, when you do engage the lawyer, you rely a lot on professional indemnities and a whole kitchen sink of assumptions. The tools have changed though from 100 years ago. 
back then they used a typewriter in 1918 was when the typewriter was invented. I'm not sure if lawyers were the early adopters, but let's pretend that they were. Today we use Microsoft Word and that's the main tool and sometimes only tool that lawyers use today. So in 1918, when the typewriter was invented, sliced bread was invented a few years later, and we come all the way to 2022, where law today, and this is you know obviously after Netflix, after iPhone, law today is still kind of stuck in the 19th century. It is manual and it is expensive. And it feels like 104 years on, lawyers still use technology to only help with the typing, i.e. the manual labor, but not with the thinking. And if one may be permitted to speak frankly, in a world where you know some cars, not all cars, some cars drive themselves or some cars purport to drive themselves, software lands or flies our planes, it feels like law is quite broken and the law firm model or lawyers are just copy and paste monkeys. And computers are even beating our doctors as well. So it seems quite mad to pay a human $600 an hour or pay a human whatever amount it is you pay to copy and paste what's on the page. Of course, I know they do value added work too, but copy and paste work is still billable. So for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not denying that legal tech exists. We know it exists. Loads of people have been doing that. There have been charts mapping out the kind of legal tech that's out there. And someone probably says, you know, we have to give it some time because legal tech is a fairly new thing. Actually, the idea of software eating law, the idea of computable contracts has been around for at least 60 years. This is a paper that was published in 1957 about how symbolic logic, which is an armor of computer science, can be used for drafting and interpreting legal documents. This book that uh, I borrowed or bought, I suppose, from Imperial College London, it was a library book, it's called Computer Science and Law. It was published in 1979. And you can see that every single chapter of those have turned into a legal tech solution that we see in the world today. Chapter three, the tax man project towards a cognitive theory of legal argument is basically TurboTax. Chapter four, the modeling of legal rules by computer is uh, basically do not pay, which is Joshua Brothers, uh, amazing startup where you know he was born in 1997 uh, and uh, he graduated from Stanford in 2020 and today he uses it to fight parking tickets to dispute airline tickets and uh, help asylum seekers uh, claim uh, refugees claim claim asylum and chapter 13 is about the automated assembly of legal documents it is basically contract express which was acquired by Thomson Reuters in 2015 and these familiar names, and I'm sure everyone has seen these before, have been around for quite some time. And there are lots of, I mean, they've been around for so much that on our website, we even portioned out a section for a dead pool to set out, you know, startups that have come and gone that deal with legal tech itself. So the question is, are we talking about computational or legal tech? Or why hasn't legal tech really caught on yet? The lazy answer you could say is that, you know, to copy, to, to parrot someone, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. But the slightly less lazy answer, I think, is that most of legal tech today seems to be working on horizontal extensive progress. You are copying things at work and you think that throwing 10 typewriters at it or wrapping a web UI around 10 lawyers solves the legal problem of manual labor. But where we want to be instead is doing vertical intensive progress. You want to do new things, you want to invent the word processor for legal tech. So not all legal tech is CLAW. CLAW is what we call computational law, especially not those that throw humans at the problem. So I don't think computational law equals law firms with different UI or a, or a legal service provider with different UI. You wouldn't call a restaurant with a website a tech solution or a tech innovation uh, in the field or even a tech company. So I don't think a lot of what counts or what claims for legal tech today is, you know, progressive in that front. And then now the other question I often get when I talk about computational, I'll talk a lot about what it isn't first before I get into it. So is it AI then? Well, what do you mean by AI? We have to break that down a little bit and try to see what people mean when they say artificial intelligence. 
So does anyone know who these two naked men are? Well, I'll save you the trouble. They are your, they are your Greek gods. They are Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo was the Greek god of music, uh, truth, prophecy, sun, light, and poetry, and Dionysus, ritual madness, fertility, winemaking, and grape harvest. And in this picture, which is admit admittedly not very good, Apollo is looking at Dionysus, and you see that look on his face? He's basically quite disapproving of his brother and saying that Dionysus is having too much fun. And if Nietzsche were here, he might say that there are two camps of AI or two camps of these brothers fall into two distinct camps, one worshipping Apollo and the other Dionysus, because Apollo is based on reason, brew based deterministic, formalist and left brain work, whereas Dionysus is emotional, he is casuistic or case based, probabilistic, realist and right brain. And I think this is basically the two camps of AI that we know of today. Well, these are the two main camps. Symbolic AI represented by Apollo and statistical AI, which is Dionysus, Dionysus camp. And, you know, it's kind of, and, and, he, and the problem why Dionysus is so happy is because statistical AI doesn't really need to do much or anything because they double in performance every 18 months. And that's basically uh, what statistical AI runs on. And obviously you can say, you know, yes, statistical AI is great, can speak loads of languages. But the problem with statistical AI, and if you were to sort of jump back to the Greek god Apollo point of view, you would say that maybe all that drinking has affected Dionysus' eyesight. Because statistical AI gives you things like how, yes, you can speak loads of languages you can expand to do this really quickly because it doubles in computing power every 18 months but you have problems where you can't tell fried chicken from a labradoodle a bagel from a or from a sleeping dog or a chihuahua from a muffin and sometimes when he drinks really too much it becomes downright embarrassing because in Dionysus world he seems to be always jumping the gun Statistical AI, or when statistical AI doesn't know the answer to something, it guesses. He guesses. It's like he doesn't even have a theory. And you would say, hey, your brothers, you both speak Greek, you're covered on marble, so you must be very similar people. And that's how statistical AI processes information. But obviously, Apollo finds this extremely infuriating because in his mind, that's not how you should work. In Apollo's world, you're supposed to reason about things in a way that fundamentally makes sense. A Polian AI or symbolic AI is AI that is AI based on algorithms that you can argue with, which is very different from AI is based on data that you extra extrapolate information from. So I really love this tweet that um, came out a couple of years ago where Computer Facts said, concerned parent, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you follow them? And a machine learning algorithm, basically statistical AI, would say, yes, I would. I'm not sure if that's the answer we want for law. So almost on to computational law. But first, we need to understand the past generations of legal tech that law has gone through so we don't reinvent the wheel and why we think now is the right time to start seriously looking into and thinking about computational law. So we're going to give you a very, very short history lesson on the history of legal tech and computational law. So in the early years, what I call Gen 1, Generation 1 of, of legal tech, this was before the era of personal computers, we were already thinking about computational law. 300 years ago, Leibniz talked about it. You know, he was quite, when he was young, he was quite optimistic. He thought that some selected men could finish the matter in five years. The older him wasn't sure, quite so sure of that position. And again, the paper that we mentioned, that was from 1957, 1960 was the first National Law and Electronics Conference held in California. The British uh, made the National Nationality Act as a logic program in 1986. Um, the team, I believe, is still working on something similar. And that's the first generation. The second generation is document assembly, which, you know, where you have the PC era, everyone's excited about personal computing and the early days of the Internet. It was a lot about commoditization, high volume, low margin work. That's where you come up with hot docs, 
which was incorporated in 1993, which does automated document assembly software. You have people like Xuri in 1999, also doing document generation. I mentioned the four Thomson Reuters, Contract Express that was acquired by Thomson Reuters that was in 2000. And obviously, I'm not going to get into details why didn't, this didn't take off. A lot of people have uh, talked about it and there have been articles about that. The short answer is it's billable hours. It is awkward for lawyers and private practice, but obviously it's not elsewhere. Then again, the problem becomes why aren't people who are in-house lawyers working in organizations, working as legal service providers, not in a law firm, not using that. So we got to Gen 3, which is open documents, where the internet was really excited about open source and with the promise that it brings. You have LegalZoom, which is in Covered in 2001. I always love going to LegalZoom's website because I'm based in Singapore. I'm speaking from Singapore now. But when you go to, when I go to LegalZoom from where I am, it says US legal help for businesses and families in Singapore. So that's quite cute because I was not expecting that because I don't think they actually have a legal presence in Singapore. 2011, we, we saw Docracy, contract standards came up, Common Accord, which is very active, DocAsemble as well, Simmons Stewart's, which is a law firm, has also started opening up their documents and sharing them with people because they believed in working on more high value work. The Singapore Law Society also started having a repository of precedents for everyone to follow, and this, this was Gen 3. So quick refresher, bearing in mind that computational law is not all legal tech, that, law, that computational law, it's not a law firm with a different user interface UI, and it's not entrenching what sucks in the current system in a future system. We get to Gen 4 because that didn't really take off either. And this is where the computer scientists start taking it computational legal or computational law very seriously. It's a generation of formal semantics. And this is where computational law comes in. So some background the foundations of Gen 4 legal tech, which is what we call computational law, is applied formal semantics. Smart contracts 1997, you might have heard some people talk about it at the conference today, but Nick Zabel posted in his blog about smart contracts very early on, and this was pretty pioneering stuff because blogs hadn't even been invented yet. Smart contracts, as we seem to call it today, hadn't even been invented, and here he is blogging about smart contracts. In 2002, he goes into a little bit more detail about formalizing the semantics of contracts and how that might look like. But it turns out that academia has been thinking about this for a while as well. In 1998, a formal language for electronic contracting started to all the way to 2015, where there was a computational representation of financial agreements, which uh, underpins a lot of what we do today. In 2015, you know, there was applying software development techniques to statutory drafting. This came out of Boston University. In short, academia has been working on this problem slowly and steadily since 19, at least since 1957. And some PhD thesis have come out of it. Many more. The idea around all this is that they believe or we believe that code is law and law is code. Final assumptions that I make about computational law before finally discussing what it actually is is that we believe that lawyers are kind of like the last tribe of programmers. If we look closely, we can see a parallel between software and law. 30 years ago, software was proprietary. There were no high level languages. There was no open source. There was no Git. If you wanted something done, you hired a team of programmers to do it from scratch with your specifications and your parameters and fees would start at $100,000. And that's kind of where most law firms or more, most legal teams are today. Not all, but most of them are basically contract churning departments, which are, in our words, small teams of assembly programmers writing proprietary code by hand. That's exactly where software was 40 years ago. And this is good news that law today looks a lot like software 40 years ago because the legal industry industry's future we think might look a lot like the software industry's first after all contracts and programs are both fundamentally specifications for the distributed execution of business processes except in this case we think lawyers have a language problem a cheeky example to illustrate my point today's lawyers use different words to mean the same thing or the same words to mean different things 
We call that pseudocode. What does the word table mean? Well, it depends on where you're from because they mean they can mean the exact opposite th things. In the UK, it means to suggest something for discussion. And in the US, it means delay discussion of a subject. I've done natural language problems that are quite cheeky. Both of these are technically fruit salads, but if you received a fruit salad that had only cucumber, tomatoes, olives, and bell peppers, you might not be too happy because you're expecting things like strawberries, pineapples, blueberries, and grapes. Natural language problem. If you define a sandwich as filling between slices of bread or between bread or between carbs, carbohydrates, you have a grilled cheese, you have a Reuben sandwich for PB and J. Would a hot dog be considered a sandwich? Natural language problem. No campaign materials or clothing allowed in the polling place. How am I supposed to go in? Am I allowed to go in naked? More natural language problems. Ribeye, steak and french fries or Caesar salad. Which of these pictures represent what the set lunch is? The answer is all of them. So natural language problems have plagued law for a long time. I'm sorry that I have in the back goal. Forgive me, Father Carson. Same concepts, wildly different connotations. Where do you draw the line? So now we get into what our version of computational law means with the now that you know what we think the problem with law today is. So we start by asking what could one do about this language problem that law has? To us, we think the first thing you have to do is to create a domain specific language for law. That is a programming language specifically designed to capture the semantics, deontics and pragmatics of law. It is a cross disciplinary synergization of over 70 years, like we've gone through already, of academic research and industry insights. With a DSL or domain specific language for law, law now has a common denominator. The disparate parts of it, contracts, your business logic, your processes, your quasi-legal documentation, your rules, your guidelines, your statutes, your regulations, they now all have a common denominator. And with the DSL, with the programming language, domain specific language, as foundational infrastructure, we can build on top of that. We can use the DSL to write law. And, and when we say law, we mean everything legal, quasi legal and anything that deals with or requires rules. And you know, it could be statutes, contracts, work orders, regulations, forms, templates, business processes, policies, circulars, internal procedures or any integrations of any of the above, because now again, it all has a common denominator, which the cool thing is, which is you allow the disparate parts of law to interact and talk to each other programmatically. And this wasn't possible before. And that's how you start to build an ecosystem of computable contracts, of computable statutes, computable processes, computable documents, computable rules, computable workflows. You get my point. And the cool thing is, it brings us from pseudocode, where lawyers use the same words to mean different things and different words to mean the same thing, that's pseudocode, to real code. So this is pseudocode, you bring it to real code, you add some curly braces, pretty syntax highlighting as you do. And this is what we think an agreement wants to be when it grows up. It wants to be a program. And the cool thing about this is that it brings you from syntax to semantics to pragmatics. Syntax as in what does it say? Words on the page, legally stick expressions. And you graduate from that to semantics. So what does it mean? What does it mean in an objective, clearly defined ma manner, which is what you see in the code? But that's not enough. You want to bring it also to pragmatics because ultimately that's what the end user, you or the people you're servicing or you're dealing with what cares about. It, it, is, it is not just the semantics of what does it mean? Pragmatics is what does it mean for me? So what if we have this? Well, you can now apply because once you have a DSL for law, you can now apply the batteries of tools that computer scientists have at their disposal, for which lawyers don't even have names for, to law and everything else involving law. So a typical software stack over the last 50 years, you know, where, you know, we've come a long way from the 40, 50 years ago, 
world of software where it was proprietary code written by hand by a team of programmers holed up in a, in, in, in a room and you know with pay starting from a hundred thousand an hour um you moved from that they have we have seen software move from the software stack to some to what that was to what it is today where you have app stores where you have self-updating packages where you have you know irc code reviews you have built-in dependency management you have open source libraries you have apps you have tutorials you have issues pull requests you have unit testing you know uh, different languages javascript java Lisp, prolog haskell and you have the lambda calculus in comparison what does the legal stack look like today we have track changes we have microsoft word basically the same thing track changes in microsoft word and i suppose we have latin so in comparison that's kind of like magic because oops sorry because every single blank area you see in the legal sec here is an area for innovation that we could catch up to software the way they did over the last 40 years and the software the, the, the legal, the future of legal can look a lot like the software stack. It just means that every single space here is a space for innovation. And that's kind of like magic. Oops, sorry. Oh, I want to, so I want to take you through an example of what this magic looks like. So if we imagine that the legal stack in the future will look a lot like the software stack that we've built over the last 40 years, when we when laws change, we have a software update. You can even make it a self-updating package. It's easy and it's been done before. If your documents depend on each other, no worries. It's called dependency management. We can layer the development architecture modularly, and we know that we can do that because software development already does that today. We can also do a acceptance testing, which allows you to evaluate compliance with business requirements and assess whether you are it is acceptable for delivery, whether it is compliant with the requirements that you've set out to begin with. We can do static analysis, which is a process where you test and calculate the effects of an immediate change to a system. You can test code without executing it because, you know, when you cause bugs at runtime, that's called litigation. What you want to do is find bugs at compile time. Find bugs at compile time, you can fix it before it is live. Bugs at runtime is litigation, not cool. Well, unless you're a litigator. So we can also unit test individual units of code. We, 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 we can set the modules together with associated control data, usage procedures, and test them to see if they're fit for use in different scenarios or different permutations that we care about. We can also do fast testing, which is an automated software testing technique where you feed invalid, random, unexpected data as input and see what happens. So that's just a few examples of what a uh, enlightened legal te tech stack could look like. And this is a well-honed software tradition. We are not just deciding that this is the obvious way to go based on a finger in the air. Adobe, which everyone is familiar with, their first product was in Photoshop. It was an InDesign that we know it today. It was a language called PostScript, which they eventually open source, and it allowed what it allowed you to express the printed page in a programmatic way. You see that with databases where SQL or SQL came up, and Oracle now basically runs that. DWG as a format is the same for architectural drawings with 3D drawings. Accounting has LP2 as well, uh, which is the language and format that allowed you to express accounting principles and uh, concepts in a programmatic form with chips, computer chips. You have very lot doing the same thing for that, but we don't have that for legal, even though all these other professional domains seem to have gone down this path. And that might be because, you know, again, legal is a very, very old industry. So perhaps it is time to, for software to eat law. So I'm going to give you two technical examples to illustrate computational law in action, just to give you a bit of flavor of what it looks like. So the first example is formal logic, which is a branch of computer science that we apply to computational law, or we apply it to building functionalities under computational law. So Ken Adams is amazing. He wrote this really great book on uh, drafting and contract. I use it to teach as well. 
and he tweeted many years ago about how how would linguists answer this? Acme shall keep the information confidential versus Acme shall pay the purchase price. You have two shells, one ongoing, one transient. How would linguists describe these words? What's his question? But in our world, when he's asking linguists, when he should be asking computer scientists, let me show you how computer scientists in computational law might solve this question. We would use something called computational tree logic, which is what hardware designers use to make sure that their chips don't have bugs. If you ship a CPU with a bug, the recall could ruin you. So you have to get it right the first time, just like contracts most of the time. So this is what we would use. And I'm not going to go into details, but I'll give you just a flavor. So if we look at this, the top circle is the present and the other circles are the futures or the possible futures. We call them states or state conditions in computer science. What CTL allows you to do is develop a notation for talking precisely about future states. We can say something will happen in at least one future, which is here, or in every possible future. I'm not going to go through all the different possibilities, but the point is we have a precise way to talk about time. And these are exactly the tools that we need to handle the question that Ken Adams posed. Acme shall keep the information confidential as AG, where you keep the confirm AG, yes, where you yes, where you keep the information confidential globally, and Acme shall pay the purchase price, which is under E, where you basically have a very set list of requirements and scenario that they have to go through before the purchase price is paid. So in computer science, even though shall is used the same way in natural language here, we have a very clear way of dealing with that. Example two is automated reasoning. Again, a computer science tool that you could build and apply to computational law. This is a technology or a branch of computer science we call model checking. This is some work that was done about, you know, many, many years ago. We, what we are looking at is a service level agreement with an ISP. You don't have to read this. I'm just going to show you the shape of it to get a quick sense of what this could do. So basically what you could do is to take every sentence and every clause in the service contract and turn it into math, which is basically programming and what programming is about. And now you can say to the computer, oh, great computer, please check my reasoning. Does the contract contain any bugs? Because now you have moved all the things that are in your natural language contract into something that is programmatic, into something that is mathematical. And we can feed both this and operationally, the contract program spells out exactly or what actually happens. This is my specification, which says at the high level what I want to happen. We feed both these things into the model checker, which is the tool that we're talking about. And the model checker can tell you, oh, it is always the case that whenever this happens, uh, the client is not obliged to pay again immediately afterward. It fails or it tells you where the bugs are or where the contract has failed your initial, your initial specifications. And you can then modify the original contract to capture the above more accurately. So, and this is important because software bugs are security vul vul vulnerabilities. In 2006, there was a million dollar case that turned on a comma. There was also a $10 million comma case that came up. There, these are the kind of bugs, well, not just commas, but software bugs that we can and should detect at compile time. Again, because finding a bug at runtime is called litigation. You know there are professional hackers, white hat hackers, who you can do to um, help you conduct penetration testing of your network. Imagine a legal pen tester powered by a legal symbolic AI. You could fuss your contracts to see what loopholes they contain. So that suggests implications for legal work today. Today you sign a contract, it sits on the shelf, and only when something is unclear or someone on the ground is not sure about what to do, they pick it up and they figure out what to do. Tomorrow maybe a service pack comes around every six months and you have to update all your agreements. So think of the last time you paid for an accountant, a photographer, a graphic designer, an architect. You know, you would think that if an accountant said, I don't need, I don't need to learn how to use spreadsheets. I don't know how to use spreadsheets because I'm really, really good at mental sums and math. Or a photographer who says, oh, I'm really hipster. I really 
do only analog photography. I don't care about post editing. Um, I'm sure those people still exist. There are people like that, but for most of the situations we're dealing with, it's not good enough. We don't want an accountant who doesn't know how to use spreadsheets and only just does manual ledgers. We don't want a photographer who doesn't do post editing for us because otherwise we'd just take it with our phone. We don't want a graphic designer who just hand draws on paper if we want digital art. And we definitely don't want an architect to have hand-drawn blueprints. We want computational architectural blueprints that can tell us different information based on the software. So, but lawyers, we kind of are quite happy paying for people to just spend all their time and resources typing in Microsoft Word. And this is what a complore or computational law-driven legal stack of the future might really look like. So all the way at the bottom, you see foundational technology for all the above, which is the DSL that we're building. And you have the intermediate or backend middle office layer, which are things that you can, once you have the DSL, you can build on top of that. You can, and the users for this are computer scientists, you have legal engineers, maybe some more technical lawyers can start working on this. And we call these legal engineering tools or low code platforms. They're mainly middle office and back end tools. You can have consistency checkers. You can do dependency management. You can do formal verification. You can do compliance testing or dynamic version control. Uh, you, not just consistency checker, you can do conflict checkers with things that you have entered into before. We can do interactions mapping with other areas of law. We can do a uh, scenario testing and say, does this apply consistently? Does this policy apply consistently across all jurisdictions or all um, personnel? Let me see how that look like. looks like. We can do outcome modeling to say, show me the financial model for this contract and show me how in a, in, a, in a graph, how it looks like in five years and who gains what from that. And on top of this, you have the front end cool new tools, which is what I call the Instagramification of law. Today, most of the time, you don't even need to learn anything about aperture, focal lengths to take a good picture. You just, the software does it for you. I don't need to learn about aperture focal lengths because I can open Instagram, I can zoom in, I can add a filter, I can, you know, the iOS that 16 that just that just got released was, um, you know, you don't even need to learn Photoshop to extract a photo, a man's face, a, pass, a woman's face, a dog's face, a biscuit from a picture. It will just automatically allow you to drag and drop that extracted portion of the photograph into whatever other areas that you need. So that's cool because I don't need to know tools, but I just need to learn how to use a very, very simple application to do that. I don't make perhaps the future, the, 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 the legal service um, department of the future doesn't even require lawyers to be staffing it because what you really need are tools that help people solve legal problems, help people answer legal questions, compliance questions without having gone to law school. Because after all, law school feels a lot like a language immersion program where all you go to learn is to learn how to talk to other lawyers, which is not very scalable. So that's the front end part of it, where your users are your consumers, your citizens, your lawyers, your business users, and um, they, they will deal with things like document specific apps, industry specific apps. You can do automated plain English explanations of user specific applied law and policy. You can even have function specific apps. Um, I think New Zealand has been exploring an eligibility calculator for benefits. Um, and, uh, and these are all the tools for legal engineers with a nice and happy user friendly UI wraparound of the tools that we have in the middle portion. And this is what I think a computational law driven legal tech stack of the future might look like. So to go back to my earlier, to my earlier question, why hasn't um, legal tech taken off yet or, or very much? I think my revised answer is it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. But sometimes it's because a man might not understand something simply because he wasn't trained in it. 
And so this is kind of, I have a parable of a brilliant cartographer who is not at all arrogant. If you meet a cartographer today from maybe just 100 years ago and you said, hey, you're, you're the best in your field. I really like what you do. Here, let me show you something from the future. Look at this iPhone it, uh, or this, 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 this smartphone. You can, you know, it, you, you, it, it can store a lot of pictures, images. You can carry it everywhere. It is, it, you can have data on it and all of those things. And the cartographer would say, oh, that is really cool. Now I don't have to physically carry all these maps or draw all these maps. I can just refer to them on the smartphone. And what that cartographer would have invented would be Google Earth, which is dumping all the data and all the things that you know into an application, which is really cool. Google Earth is really cool, but Google Earth isn't really useful for most people. You don't use Google Earth every day, but you know what you use every day? You use Google Maps every day. And that requires a computer scientist to look at what the cartographer or a, a map maker or a study planner does and say, you know, maps are really cool, but you know what software can do? Software can go further. It can tell you, hey, take this route if you're leaving right now, because the usual route is jammed up because of a traffic accident or well do you want to take the fastest route or do you want to take the cheapest route because of tolls or it can even tell you well if you want to get to whatever that's on your calendar that's happening in an hour you have to leave right now given current traffic conditions and those are functionalities that you can only build if you understand what computers, what technology, what software can do. And it's not something that cartographers train in. So I feel like a lot of legal tech hasn't taken off because a lot of people trying to solve the legal problem are lawyers while well, working independently, however well-meaning, without working with computer scientists who are the, the who are domain experts in technology. So how is computational law different from just writing something something in code. Um, this is something that came up quite often when people ask us. We say, and my answer is that classical AI is based on principles of intelligence, where the intelligence itself is separate from the software, hardware, wetware implement, implementation. So you can attempt to codify the thinking and reasoning required for a problem and have that separate from the implementation of it. And why this is important is because in implementations of classical AI, you separate the knowledge database from the processing or implementation database. So an example of this, if why it might be a good idea to do this. So you could say, well, why don't we just build an app today to solve all of these things without going to DSL approach? And we believe that that's not, uh, it's not tech agnostic enough and it's not future proof enough. Imagine in 2010, your boss wants a wizard for a user in the form of a web app and you say, okay, most popular language at that point, let's do it in Python. And then 2015, ooh, the iPhone is taking off. Everyone loves the iPhone. We need a mobile app to support that. We'll say, let's do it in Swift. And as you go on every year, there may be new technologies, new systems that come up. And if you don't separate the knowledge base from the application code, you have to keep rebuilding all of these things each time. But if you separate out the legal logic, which is what the DSL can do and all the sort of base information that you have, that is completely standalone. And your application layer, which is your wraparound of that in JavaScript, Python, Swift, Solidity, whatever it is, if you have that separate, you don't really need to rebuild the whole thing each time. And that is why we think computational law is a lot more um, sustainable and scalable, a long-term solution than just, let's just build an app for it. So this means that computational law is the universal adapter for you to plug into your, plug your workflows into digital infrastructure. And let's not forget that the next generation is already born digital. And I have this, and I teach a module at the Singapore Management University, and my law students have this problem as well. They find it completely bizarre when they go to a law firm and they're forced to remember to save your Word documents because they grew up using Google Docs, and the idea of saving a document seems insane or having to save it. So this means that when we have a generation that's coming up that is born digital, we have people working in the world that are born digital, we need to reduce the translation gap for better regulatory and service outcome. 
And to do this, we need to better understand how machines and software work so that we can talk to them, build or help build the tools and learn to operate better in a world that is built off their backs. And very, very uh, quick example of rules as code, which is an arm of computational law and what we deal with. There's a lot of scholarship on this that goes back a long time just to you know, show you the basis. And many governments, uh, agencies and uh, regulators are working on this as well. In the, I think this was the OECD report. Yeah, in, in, in 2018, um, they talked about the, how different supervisory agencies and applications have come up. And you will see that machine readable regulations whilst on the list of aspirational work and policies to implement, it was not really worked on anywhere as well. And, um, you know, Singapore has a very, very rudimentary version that comes back, that, that, that solves Australia's problem. Um, and, um, and, and, and we talk and we see a lot of people writing about how a machine readable world is very important because you don't just want things that are able to be displayed, capable of being displayed on a machine. Like, for example, I don't just want something showing up as a PDF with dead data. I want machine readable world so that it can be plugged in so that the algorithms are transparent because you want to be able to have this not be dead data. You want every time you interact with something to be live data. And so the New Zealand government did a very small example where they took something like this and they uh, they, 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 they um, took the legislation, which is the Rates Rebates Act, and they put in the system called Open Fisca, which then powers public API. And that's great because um, this is one form of very cool legal tech innovation or computational law innovation. But in our world, I it's we feel that this is still an analog to digital conversion. And this is your output. When you do analog to digital, you have a sentence that has over a thousand words and looks like object code, but this is the output. And if you want to turn it back into a high level programming language, you have to build a decompiler, you have to do reverse engineering. And I don't think anyone when they were nine years old said that I want to grow up to be a statutory interpretation reverse engineer, because if you build it the analog to digital way, you will encounter that problem. So we say, let's make it born digital. So you start with digital instead of starting with analog, start with digital, start writing whatever it is in digital. You compile it to analog. And that's iPhomorphism. The out, the out, this is the output. It looks very much like English, but this is the, the, the words in green are programming code. And there are lots of people talking about isomorphism, which is how and how important it is. But the cool thing about isomorphism is that code doesn't just have to compile to natural languages. It can compile to legislation. It can compile to simple math, arithmetic, YAML for testing, or you know solving and, and, and solving things. And 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 this is cool because now you can have rules. You can have laws and everything in the common denominator and you, out, you can output it to any version of digital representation that suits your needs, for example. And so I'm going to give you a very quick example before I run out of time in Singapore. So recently at the Center for Computational Law, we did a rules as code uh, proof of concept where the idea was that, OK, the Personal Data Protection Commission said you know, when the laws change, it takes us quite some time for our regulations, for our guidelines, for our FAQs to be updated with the new law. And um, and we said, OK, um, can you identify a very small part of what you of, of what this problem is and let us build a proof of concept for that? So they said, yes, the bulk of our problems come in when data breaches happen, but not all data breaches are reportable to the commissioner. So how does an end user figure that out? How do they determine if that is reportable or notifiable or not? So we said, OK, let's identify all the relevant portions in the statutory and subsidiary legislation that are relevant to data breach notification. We read all of them, pull out the relevant sections, and there's also a 40 page guide on data breaches. So we, we look at all of this and we convert this material and obviously traditionally this was you know what they had to do by hand manually and we said okay let's take all of that and 
do it computational legally. So we take English to the programming language and then we build isomorphisms from that. So what we did was first take the English, wrote it in the programming language, which we call L4, the DSL for law, the L4. So this is a spreadsheet interface, but it is program code. This runs, this is code. This is how L4 our language looks like. Every line of code has a corresponding act or section where the rules come from. So we're not making it up. You can always look beneath the hood to see where the rules are from. So you write it and, um, and uh, you know, you, you can change things anytime you want because it's a spreadsheet it's very easy to learn and from that we can say well do you want this to be a web tool how do you want it to look like and um, we said okay let let us just run this through another program and basically we got to a website we said and we didn't build this website i mean obviously you can make it prettier and just hire designers for this and all that but the questionnaire itself is automatically generated from the rules that we created. So all the rules that you saw in the spreadsheet here, we basically said, OK, now let's output this to a website where you ask a question and of the end user and say, you know, do you are you in public agency? Are you this? Are you that? And as they answer the question, certain questions that grayed out, some some questions get deleted as you answer yes or no to certain questions and eventually you get to the answer must you notify the top no or must you notify yes and again i must remind you that we did not create the website we just it just net it was automatically generated from just having codified a few lines of uh, well lines of code from the rules that were relevant to the question of data notifiable data breaches and again we, it doesn't have to be a web tool L4 or whatever you wrote the rules in can output to a flowchart for you to map what what an organization has to think through before they decide if they have to uh, report something. We can also build internal tools based on those codified rules. We can run unit tests of different examples that we throw at the program and say, can you tell us what happens for data breaches involving multiple organizations? And this is something you can do as uh, if you are a sort of um, uh, 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 working with legislation to figure out if what you have written does exactly what it says in code and in natural language. So Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world and all these companies, you know, I, I firmly believe that even though Minecraft is a very cool gaming company, Lego should have invented Minecraft, not Minecraft. You know, it's the obvious way to go. So lawyers don't feel like the obvious people to solve this. I think we have a play a role to play with what computational law is, but a lot of the tools have to come from the imagination of computer scientists trying to solve the problems articulated by lawyers. So uh, my co-founder Meng posted about this vision that we had for computational law and then Dreesen retweeted and said bingo and that's a lot of what we do today. So this is the computational law research program that we do at SMU and um, I won't go get into details. We do industry affiliate program. You can bring us use cases where the law set of your use case become codified, machine readable and consumable and digitally compatible. I, I can send a brochure over to anyone who's interested in learning more about why bringing us a workflow is useful and interesting, but I'm going to just get to the end and stop there so that I can answer any questions that you might have.